me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 10. <clears throat> After revealing the frightful scenes which followed the sounding of six terrible trumpets, the picture changes and John sees a mighty angel straddling the land and the sea declare that there will be no more time. These words send a shiver of fear or perhaps of anticipation up and down our spine. There will be no more time. Many times we have no warning of it. I think of that tsunami which recently struck the coast of Japan. How many people there? No warning at all that they had no more time. It was over. More recently in Joplin, Missouri, a tornado struck before people even realized it was coming. And so many people, their time ended. We only hope and pray that they were ready for their Savior. We never know how much time we have left. The Bible warns us not to presume that we have a lot of time. But this angel announces for planet Earth, there will be no more time. Does the angel's pronouncement elicit fear or joy in your heart? We've been talking about it a long time. You know, I've been an Adventist for approximately 60 years, and for all that time we've been talking about the end of the world and the ushering in of eternal righteousness. This angel that speaks following the sounding of the sixth trumpet announces that that time has come. You know, we read in the seals in the, when Jesus opened the fifth seal, Chapter 6, the souls under the altar cried out, How long, O Lord? And now, a few chapters later, this angel announces, The mystery of God is soon to be finished, and time will be no more. This, I think, is one of the most exciting proclamations in all the Bible. One that uh, we who are Adventists are looking forward to with great Anticipation, when the time is announced, there is no more time. When we look up and we see that cloud the size of a man's hand coming to this earth that becomes larger and larger. So important is this announcement that the angel swore by the almighty God of creation. Now in court, we place our hand on the Bible and we swear what? To tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And to do so and then to lie is perjury, a serious offense, punishable, unless you happen to be the president, and, uh, but we'll not get into that. The angel swears by the eternal God, the creator of heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. Now, this isn't the purpose of this sermon, but I might remind you that Seventh-day Adventists still believe that God is the creator of the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it. And if we have someone watching on the Internet, Adventists believe God is the creator. And this angel swears by the creator that the mystery of God is soon to be finished. Now there is no higher power that one can swear to. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephes uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews uh, chapter 6. And we're going to begin looking here in verse 13. When God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. 
Surely blessing I will bless you and multiply I will multiply. And so after that, he, he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For, God, for man indeed swears by greater and an oak for confirmation is for them the end of all dispute. Thus, God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Who's he talking about? Us. The heirs of the promise. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, what did it say? You know, some people ask, is there anything God can't do? According to Scripture, God can't lie. He will not lie. Okay, we go on. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become the high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now he says here that God cannot lie. And he has given us this promise that he's coming back again as an anchor to our soul. The young men that were baptized, you may need this anchor. The devil isn't happy when anybody gives their life to Jesus Christ. The devil will bring in opposition. He will bring in everything he can. And I might say to the congregation that let us not be like the devil. You know, the Bible calls the devil the accuser of the brethren. You've heard that? And when the woman was brought in adultery before Jesus, Jesus says, no, neither do I condemn thee. Let us not be on the side of the devil seeking to find a reason to accuse or to find fault with those who've committed their lives to Jesus Christ. Let us be as Christ and always seek to hold them up before the Lord in prayer. I don't want to hear that anybody is... Uh, playing the role of the devil uh, in this church. God has promised that very soon the great controversy between Christ and Satan, good and evil, right and wrong, will come to an end. Very soon the mystery of the plan of salvation will be fulfilled. Very soon we will receive our eternal inheritance, our heavenly home. Very soon we will be united with our loved ones who have died in Christ. Very soon, sin and sinners will be no more. Very soon, the seventh angel will sound his trumpet, and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. God has promised, and it is impossible for God to lie. Now, at times, we may become discouraged. At times it may seem that the devil is winning the battle. At times we might wonder why do the innocent suffer and die. At times we may wonder why God is not answering our prayers according to the way we think they should be answered. This mighty angel promises us that soon and very soon all the prophecies proclaimed by all the prophets of long ago, will be fulfilled. God will come to usher in his eternal kingdom. And the saints can say, Maranatha. We read that in the end of Revelation. That's the promise. But it is not the end of the vision. John is commanded to go and to take a little book. So turn back to uh, Revelation 10. He's to take a little book from this angel. And this angel appears to be uh, Jesus Christ. Because he's clothed in the clouds. 
a rainbow on his head, and his face shone as the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. That description is given elsewhere of Jesus Christ. So he's to go and to take this little book and eat it, and it'll be as sweet as honey in his mouth, but bitter in his stomach. So John did as he was told. He took that little book, and he ate it. And sure enough, it tasted sweet as honey, but gave him a stomachache. How sweet the gospel is. If we can think back to when we became one of Christ. Can we think back that far? It's kind of hard. But I can remember, and it was 60 years ago for me. Think back to that time when you heard the gospel. You learned that Christ has died for your sins. Your sins are forgiven. God has a place prepared for you in his kingdom. And he's coming back to receive you. It is so sweet. And yet it says... It was bitter to the tummy. Accepting the gospel makes the dragon angry, and he is sure to persecute us. Whether at home or at work or in the world, there will be opposition. And if there's no opposition, perhaps we're going the wrong way. Perhaps we're going downstream. Because if we're going upstream, it may be a tough paddle and a tough time. God doesn't promise us the way is going to be easy. Rather, he assures us that we will face bitter opposition. Look over here in, in Matthew 10. This is one of the strangest statements that Jesus made. Matthew chapter 10. Beginning in verse 34, don't think that I've come to bring peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Doesn't that kind of strike us the wrong way? You know, the prince of peace. And he says, I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. Why? He goes on to tell us. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus promises us there may be some pretty tough times. The church was already going through it. In Acts chapter 8, <clears throat> we took back here to Acts, Acts chapter 8. It was right after the Gospels, before the Epistles. Acts chapter 8. And verse 1, now Saul was consenting to his death, and at that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And then again, if you turn over to chapter 12, verse 1, it talks about Herod also initiating a persecution. So no sooner had this fledgling church begun than there was persecution against it. 3,000 on the day of Pentecost accepted Jesus Christ, and then Acts goes on to say another 5,000, 8,000 within a day or two. Think about that. Church grew from a little handful to 8,000 virtually overnight, and the devil was angry, and persecution broke out. That's what Revelation is telling. It's as sweet as honey in the mouth.
It tells of sins forgiven, adoption into the family of God, eternal life, the presence of Jesus. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. It tells of a purpose in our life, a meaning that we have when we, before we were like living a meaningless existence. It tells of a new nature. It tells, as we studied in the Sabbath school lesson, of removal of these filthy garments of our righteousness and bestowal upon us the robe of Christ's righteousness. It tells us of a place prepared for us in heaven. It tells of the power of the Holy Spirit which God gives to those who are baptized and follow Jesus. The power given to that we might resist the devil and overcome. It tells of a new family family of believers who are here to encourage and strengthen us. And in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 it tells us of ministering spirits sent to minister unto them who are the heirs of salvation. It is sweet as honey. There's no better message in all the world even if you were told that you won the lottery which you won't be because you don't play the lottery. There is nothing sweeter than the gospel. And yet, he says, it can be as bitter in the stomach. We've already read about that, haven't we? In the seven churches, the second church, Smyrna, was a persecuted church. In the seven seals, in the second seal, the opening of the second seal, revealed persecution. You remember the, the, the rider on the red horse bearing a sword, slaying those who accepted Christ. In the next chapter, chapter 11, which we'll get to ultimately, in chapter 11 we read about the two witnesses who were slain and their bodies laid in the street. If we go back to our own history, we find uh, the Millerites looking forward to the coming of Christ with great delight. And then that morning of October 23, 1844, their hearts were broken. They said they wept all night, and many of them for days to come. That which they thought was sweet turned out to be bitter. But that's not the end. It's not the end. The prophecy goes on. Look in, let's see what verse we have here. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. He gives a command. He gives the warning, but he also gives us a commission. And that commission is to carry this message, which we love, to the entire world. Jesus gave that just before his crucifixion. Go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Revelation 18 pictures another mighty angel. Look at that. And the whole earth was illuminated with his glory. Now, does it say the whole earth except China and India? And the Middle East? It says the whole world was illuminated with his glory. We're looking forward to what's to come. You know, the greatest part is not behind us. The great part's ahead of us. And the young people who are baptized, I trust that they will live to see these amazing events that God has prepared. He said, go on again. You may go over some bumps. You may fall. You may falter. But he said, 
go on and prophesy again to nations, languages, and even rulers. Jesus tells us that the time is going to come when we're going to be brought in before rulers to witness before our faith. And I trust these young men to be among them. I used to think so when I was younger. But um, I believe that uh, we are approaching these times. And he tells us that we are to go and proclaim. We are to accept that little book, to accept the gospel, to accept the teachings, the truth that God gives us regarding Jesus Christ and salvation. We are to go forward into baptism as the young men did. We're to face whatever troubles and trials there may come. Not let it get us down. And then we're to go and proclaim this wonderful truth that God has given us to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That is what Revelation is telling us. And it's for all of us. All of us who have received the truth of the gospel. called upon to share that gospel with others in the marketplace, in the workplace, wherever we meet people. Pray daily that God will open up the avenue. You don't have to be a path, but ask God to open up the way that you can share his love with others. He's called us to do it. He's given us the gospel and ask us to share it with others.